Hi, I'm Terrence Bird. At Health First New Jersey, we believe everyone should be informed about the important health care issues that affect them and their families. That's why Health First is proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Breakthroughs in Cardiac Medicine, next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, the heart of academic medicine. Health First New Jersey, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, and by Roche. Welcome to Caucus New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato, right here in the studio to discuss breakthroughs in cardiac medicine are Dr. Deepak Saluja, who is the Director of Electrophysiology Lab at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. Dr. Aliyah Brown is a practicing cardiologist and spokesperson for the American Heart Association. Charles Marciano is a recipient of a cardiac procedure that we'll be discussing here today. And finally, Dr. Lon Castle, Senior Director of Clinical Innovation at Express Scripts. I want to thank all of you for joining us. Doctor, you are the Director of the Electrophysiology Lab at Robert Wood Johnson. What is that lab all about? Well, in the Electrophysiology Lab um, at Robert Wood Johnson, we uh, perform all sorts of procedures that are designed to either prevent or cure uh, arrhythmias. And is one of them uh, remote magnetic technology, more specifically the procedure uh, that we were talking about before, remote magnetic navigation. Yeah. What is that? What are you navigating? Well, with a remote magnetic navigation is a technology that you use to move a catheter that performs an ablation. So an ablation uh, is? An ablation is, a, is the destruction of part of the cardiac tissue that's involved in an arrhythmia. So if you have an arrhythmia... An arrhythmia is? An arrhythmia is an abnormal... I'll be doing this all day. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. An arrhythmia is an abnormal heart rhythm. The heart's supposed to beat a certain way, it's supposed to be regular, it's supposed to be a certain rate. If it's not regular, if it's not the rate that it's supposed to be, that's an arrhythmia. So uh, usually there's a, a part of the heart or a particular, uh, certain, you know, different parts of the heart that are involved in the arrhythmia. An ablation procedure destroys that part of the heart using typically uh, uh, radio frequency. Now Charles, your procedure was what? So I use a smaller word, an ablation, saying that's, that's the word I use for it, and that was because my heart was racing at 210 beats a minute, et cetera. Uh, uh, tachycardia, they call it. He could tell you better. And at the end of the day... Doctor, you perform that mm -hmm. procedure. Go ahead. And, it, and at the end of the day, if they don't do that, your heart cannot sustain that kind of a heartbeat. They can put you on meds, and they did, but eventually uh, I call him the electrician. Uh, I didn't have a blockage. It wasn't that. It was, I call it an electrical problem. So hold on, came Charles, you, it. sorry for interrupting. You had had heart surgery before this. Yeah, I'm 65. I had heart surgery at age 50, mild heart attack. I had, no, not sir, I had a heart attack at age 50, pardon me, 56 years old, uh, quadruple bypass at Robert Wood Johnson. Four years ago, uh, insertion of a defibrillator pacemaker. And back in October, November of this year, the ablation, which Dr. Solution did. That's my word for it anyway. The other words too complicated for me. <laughs> how, did, how did you help him? Well, as uh, Charles was saying, his heart was beating um, extremely fast in an extremely dangerous way. It's uh, one of the ways that people die suddenly is that their heart beats too fast and it can't sustain itself, as he was saying. Uh, we tried medicines, didn't work. So I did an ablation procedure on him, um, which fixed the problem by destroying the part of the tissue that was involved in that arrhythmia. And, that, and it's minimally invasive? Yeah. So this is a big, because this program is about you know, innovation, cardiac medicine, innovation. That's a big innovation. Yeah, it's, we've been doing these procedures actually for some time. The, the ablation has been um, in sort of major uh, circulation for the last 10 years, But isn't the magnet years. part new? The magnet part is new. That is the part that was, that was sort of novel for him. Um, typically, if you're going to do an ablation procedure, the way we used to do it is you hold the catheter in your hands, you move it over here, and it moves in the heart. Um, and the way it does that is that it's rigid. What we did with Charles is that uh, we used magnets to move the tip of the catheter instead of moving it with my hands. The normal catheter is pretty, as I said, rigid and inflexible. This catheter is like spaghetti. 
So if it hits something that it shouldn't be hitting, if it um, smacks against the wall of uh, the heart where I don't want it to smack against, it doesn't poke through, it doesn't cause any damage. What impact does it have finally on Charles' you know, prognosis and his ability to move forward? Well, it lets us do his procedure in a safer manner. It makes it less likely that he's going to have a complication, that he's going to have bleeding, that he's going to have um, some of the things that happen to people with uh, conventional technology. A lot of cardiac breakthroughs. I mean, not, most of them, many of them are based in technology, based in, in minimally invasive uh, procedures that we're talking about, but, but not all. Yeah. Let's talk about it from the American Heart Association's perspective. Talk about some of the cardiac innovations that need to be understood by people watching right now. Well, most important innovation that we're doing now is really trying to do some genetic testing and figure out if we can get gene therapy. Um, gene to, therapy? Yes. Give us a for instance. So for instance, if uh, you have a family history of cardiac disease, we want to find out if there are certain genes that link up to uh, increased plaque formation and increased inflammation in the arteries of the heart. If we can map out those genes, then we could know what your risk is and try to create therapies that can uh, attack inflammation and attack your body so that you won't produce so much calcification. That's new. That's what we're in the works of trying to, to, to do. The newest therapy, uh, some of the new no, uh, innovations we're doing is diagnosing uh, disease maybe earlier with CAT scans of the arteries, CT angiogram, we can diagnose plaque and uh, calcifications within the arteries so that we can tell you what your overall risk is for uh, blockage and coronary artery disease. By the way, log on to our website, you'll see up throughout this program uh, to find out more about cardiac medicine, the new procedures, the breakthroughs that uh, are being talked about in this program. Lon, I'm going to ask you this, uh, uh, Dr. Castle, I'm curious about this. Your organization, Express Scripts. First of all, describe what it is, and I'm going to ask you about Screen RX, which is a very interesting innovation. So, Express Scripts is a pharmacy benefit manager, and what that means, when you go to the pharmacy and pay $5, $10 for your medications, we're the company that helps negotiate between whoever provides your health benefits and the manufacturers where you get the medications from. We negotiate those prices and then allow you to get your medicines for less money. Screen RX. Yes. You told our producers, Screen RX can predict who might neglect taking their meds. What does that have to do with innovations in cardiac medicine? Well, specifically, what you're talking about with um, they're, what they're doing in the American Heart Association with predictive genomics, trying to figure out who's going to get disease so you can prevent it. Right. What people get when they get disease is they get medicines to treat it. Most everybody has 65% of people, it's medications that treat their diseases. What we're saying is, okay, if this is what your treatments are, medications, you should take them. 89% of people say that they're adherent to their medications. In fact, adherent, only about... Whoa, what does that word mean? Oh, adherent means that they are taking their medications. They're doing the right thing. They're, they're taking compliant. their medications as you... Told, it's similar to compliance, yes. Okay. Taking medications as you ask them to take it. But in fact, only about 46% take it in that manner. And you have the ability through this technology to do what? Right. So Express Scripts has about 100 million Americans in the benefit. When you have data sets that large, this is the new innovations, is where you're really doing a lot of data set mining. We took 600,000 patients, and we looked at their adherence metrics, and then we looked at pieces about their stories, their history, 400 different variables. And what we found out is we can actually predict with about 96% accuracy within the next year who's likely to become non-adherent to their medication. You're shaking your head yes. Well, I get... Uh, uh literature from them, notes from them all the time when people are not um, refilling their prescriptions. So if uh, Mr. Jones has not come in to refill his medication for his cholesterol, I'll get a note from Express Strip saying your patient may be in, not adherent to your uh, prescription plan. Right, and that's a rep that's a not a proactive way in doing it. We're waiting until they're not adherent exactly. and then we're telling them. What yes. we're doing with this model that we've created is actually figuring out who is going to become mm -hmm. and reaching out to those patients beforehand and giving them interventions that are specific for what they're likely to do wrong and try and stop well, them before it happens. I'm curious about this. Now, I, I don't know if Charles is in the system or not. Um, we can check after the show. But I'm curious about this. Did you have a sense with Charles after everything that he's been through right as a patient for 15 years now right not with dr solution for 15 years but as a patient no no as a patient you've been dealing with and through robert wood a lot of it through, through cardiac but, but through cardiac issues for 15 absolutely. years is my point absolutely do you think 
you are a patient who is, I don't know if the word's compliant or just, just say does the right thing, that you do the right thing with the medications that you have? The answer to that is very simply yes with the medications. I've taken them faithfully 98, 99% of the time. I wouldn't be able to answer the same way if I exercise as much as they want me to do all the time. That would be a different subject, but medication-wise, yes. Doctor, let me ask you something. The recovery process, because we're talking about innovation, technological innovation, the magnetic piece of this, all those pieces. How involved do you get in the recovery piece of this? How much advice do you give? How engaged are you in what a patient needs to do after you do the important work that you do? Well, I, we are as involved as we need to be is the, um, uh, I guess, the simplest answer to that. Thankfully, par part of the, part of the um, uh, impetus for, for creating these innovations is to actually reduce the recovery period and make the whole process simpler. So instead of having to do an open heart procedure where you would need a week, of, uh, uh, a week in the hospital and then a, rehabil a rehabilitation stay, we're able to do this so that people like Charles can leave the next day. And actually, the instructions become very uh, simple. Um, so uh, for the complicated procedures, I get um, uh, involved in uh, making sure that the patients are doing what they're supposed to be doing and not doing what they're not supposed to be doing. Um, but my goal is to make the process so simple that I have to give the, the, as little advice, uh, advice as possible. Doctor, let's do this. I'm going to go through some other innovations. What innovations, what breakthroughs, cardiac MRI? Well, cardiac MRI, you've heard of MRIs of other parts of the body, the head, the shoulder, that's, um, people are uh, used to thinking about, uh, about that. We're starting to do MRIs of the heart, which gives us similar information about the, about the heart specifically, um, and th that, we, that we haven't been able to uh, really obtain before in other ways. You can learn a lot about not just the structure of the heart, but about what's inside the muscle. Um, which is uh, extremely valuable information that we'd previously have to use, for example, a biopsy for. So now there's better information that we are getting through different tests. Absolutely. Uh, let, let me try a different one. The other one I'm curious about is, is there new information, Dr. Brown, that we have, breakthrough innovation, that the American Heart Association has access to, is publishing, regarding diet and exercise? What do we know? Diet and exercise is key. What we know is if you follow a good uh, exercise program, meaning 30 minutes, five days per week, or 150 minutes of exercise per week, you can reduce your overall cardiovascular risk. If you're eating a diet full of fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, it's fish twice per week. Uh, if you're eating whole grains, multigrain products, brown rice, uh, red, uh, sweet potatoes, all of those things reduce your risk for developing high blood pressure, developing diabetes, as well as developing high cholesterol. So all of our data has shown that if you do those things and you don't have significant risk factors such as family history, um, then you can reduce your risk substantially. Go ahead. And I'm going to ask Charles about his diet. Go ahead. I was going to say, but that's... So you can get ready. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. But their genomics initiative ties exactly genomics, into that yes. because what they're doing to figure out what your risk is. Okay, so everybody knows they're supposed to do diet and exercise. Right. Everybody does it. Very few people do it like they're supposed to. That's because we say you should do that, and it's a blanket statement. Now, if I come to you with, after I get some genetic analysis of you and say you're at a five yes. times higher risk for heart disease, yeah. and you should do diet and exercise because of that, I'll bet you that makes a huge impact okay, on you. Okay, let's play this out for a second. My father's father... Uh, died of a heart attack at 44. Right. My father's younger brother died at 57. My father has had multiple cardiac procedures, and there are a whole range of other men in our family. I have come to the conclusion that I'm not like them. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually being very serious. I've heard it, I've seen it, but I in all seriousness, look at them, and I say a lot of them smoked, and they didn't take care of themselves. We eat differently. It's a different generation, different time. Exercise is part of my life. However, if you had that information, you could help me better understand my odds. Right. We could tell you you are more like them than you think you are. Yes, you're doing uh. all the right things, but <laughs> are those right things going to overcome your genetics? Exactly. Well, what would I do with that information, in all seriousness? Well, what you would do with it is exactly what you're doing now. 
Now, if you look at uh, autoimmune disease processes, a lot of autoimmune diseases are triggered by inflammation or triggered by viral disease. So what, that's what genomics is trying to figure genomics. out. Genomics. In, in a sense of for your father and for your grandfather, maybe they smoke, maybe that inflammation from the smoking caused accelerated coronary artery disease right. and hardening of their arteries. For you, you're not gonna do those things. So you know what your family history is. We may map out your genes and say, yes, you're at risk, but we already know you are. So what we need to do as physicians, as uh, people in the healthcare field, is really try to zone in on you, letting you know what you need to do to reduce your risk, the things that you're doing just now, reducing inflammation, reducing viral incidence of uh, increasing ca uh, atherosclerosis in your arteries, exercising, dieting. Lifestyle. Exactly. Doctor, how much do you, uh, uh, go ahead, answer, the, the, talk to us about uh, your well, diet. My, well, You're not well, ducking uh, this, by the way. No, that's okay. Because your wife, I just saw you met your wife, that's okay. your lovely wife on the way your, in, she said, your, they ask you this. Your family tree, as far as heart attack and problems, are similar to mine. We'll get into all the people that have had it, but I can go assure ahead. you, it's a genetic thing, most of it. So I haven't been bad on a diet as much as, you know, they have some kind of crazy number you guys have, 27 point something times your whatever height and weight. You Go should, ahead. I should be. Because you look like you're in good shape to me. I, well, 195 pounds I should be. 210, 208, 208, I look kind of really thin. I'm 213. I was 215, 241 in the hospital. He says a lot of it is water weight. You want to lose weight, go in the hospital for 24 days. <laughs> you lose weight. So the diet is, is very, very good now, but you cannot ru outrun your genetics. But I will say this, I agree totally. If we knew more, if we were more aware, da 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 on those things, of course it's going to help you. Right. But most people, I don't think, in my opinion, they don't want to really either listen to the doctor. They're afraid of the doctor. They don't trust the what doctor. What about you? Have you changed your diet considerably? I, the answer is absolutely yes. Yes. You, you, okay. I can get your wife in here to confirm you can, this. You can. She'll Are, tell you. Do, you. do you eat more vegetables and fruit than you did before? I eat, absolutely. I eat less food than I did before. Oh, I eat do. less than I I'm walking at least five days a week, a mile and a half stuff. a day. But, at the, but still, that be, that's a personal decision. Okay. Did, does he, can you see the difference in your patient from when you first met him? Oh, absolutely. When Talk I about first, it. When I first met Charles, he was, he, uh, he was on death's door. Uh, you know, he was his... Uh, his heart rate was going up, like you said, and you know, 200 beats a minute, and he was um, uh, he was not doing so good. You know, and about 30 pounds hospital. heavier, I think he said. So yeah, go ahead. yeah, and Roughly. about 30, yeah, about 30 Roughly. pounds heavier. And some of that was water, but uh, we, but we fixed the problem, and it's uh, eight, nine months later, and he's done all the right things. He's dropped weight, and uh, he's doing great now. Okay. Uh, by the way, I'm going to give you a chance because I give give it short shrift to some of the other innovations cardiac innovations that you want to talk about that we've missed. What are the other really important initiatives that people need to know about in terms of cardiac medicine, technological or otherwise? Well, I, I think as, as we were talking about with the, with the other panelists, we're talking about you know, genomics. That's really where this is, this is going. What we've been doing so far is dealing with disease after it develops in a generic way. And it, I think what we're going to be doing, what we're already doing, what we're going to be doing more of in 10, 15 years is, is preventing disease by understanding how it occurs in the first place. Not so much by diet and exercise, because like you said, people, they need to do that, but we all know that. It's the stuff, it's the stuff we don't know that's going to be really innovative. Knowing what your gene profile is, is is helpful for you, but it's even more helpful for your kids who are maybe 12 years old and haven't yet it lived long enough to develop heart disease, but they're going to know what they really have to stay away from in order to never develop the disease in the first place. It's also going to be useful to develop drugs that interact with those genes to change the way the body works, so that you don't develop the you, you so you don't develop those diseases in the first place. So I think that's where all this is going. And has the potential to change the prognosis long term in terms of cardiac outcomes. It has the potential to change prognosis and prevent the disease in the first place, which is, which is the best possible um, outcome you can have. Yeah. Jump back in. Right, and then when you take that, you're essentially you're screening for disease, and then you try and screen out the disease, but when the disease does hit mm -hmm. and the people have to take medication, you start to screen 
through genetics, what medications would work for them, what medications would give them side effects, and then with the ScreenRx tool that we have, you start to screen whether the or screen not... ScreenRx tool. Correct. Yeah, what you would start to look for is then, okay, now, which of these people who are going to be at the greatest risk for falling off their therapies, and can we help them before they fall off what their therapies? What would you therapies? do? Say, say you had a sense that they were going to fall off. What would oh. you do? So there's different interventions depending upon what things that make it. You can have behavioral and non-behavioral things. If, you, if they're worried clinically the drug isn't going to work for them or they're going to get side effects, those are discussions we would send them back to their physicians. They have those discussions to make sure that they understand what the medications are supposed to do. If it's they're forgetting to take their medication, they're forgetting to get it renewed, then there are things that we can do related to calls or timers. And what we found in part of the study is that timers. if you, yes, that tells you when you're supposed to take your oh, medication. Okay. If Got you it. miss it, beeps. What we found is if you use some of those technologies and you just give it to everybody who's not adherent to their medications, you get about a 2% lift in them taking their medications more frequently. But if you target it to the people where it's the behavioral issues that we've identified, you get a 16% lift. So you make a huge difference just targeting your therapies to the right people. And that's what this is all about, just like targeting your wellness initiatives to the right people, targeting you know, who you're going to do surgery on with the right technology. This is all about technology and using I'm curious about this as we're talking about all these issues. Uh, people continue to be fascinated by heart-related programs that we've done over the two decades that we've been doing this. Do you have any idea who logs onto your website? Because you are the biggest, if you will, educational organization in, in, in the world probably when it comes to to heart-related issues, who is logging onto your website? Everyone is logging onto the website. Men, women, uh, children of uh, heart disease victims are, are uh, logging on. Uh, we have many different tools that they can use to determine what their risk is. We have programs uh, for Go Red for women uh, for them to do uh, things to help reduce their overall risk. Uh, so we have many people logging on. And if you look at when the Go Red for Women movement started several years ago, uh, heart disease was not uh, thought of as the number one uh, killer of women and men in this country. And since we've been uh, out there educating the community and educating the people, we've seen that the number of deaths from heart disease has been reduced. It's still the number one killer, but we're doing better things with technologies, with uh, education, with changing diet, lifestyle changes, uh, and also the primary doctor screening for uh, those risk factors and helping to uh, treat those causes as By well. By the way, are you required to wear red every time you're on television? <laughs> Absolutely. As an American, <laughs> I've noticed that. It Can looks I, great. It does look great. Can I make a plug Real for Real quick, for I'm going to come back to Charles. Sure. Go ahead. The American Heart Association, women and heart disease, they should go on their website. There is a video that they have there. Elizabeth Banks is yes. starring in the video. It is one of the most hysterical. Hilarious. Elizabeth Funny. Banks is? She's an actress. actress. She okay. was in Scrubs. Yes. Okay. Uh, she does a, a video on there which is hysterical, and every woman will recognize themselves in it, and oh, then every woman will say, oh, my God, is Just this me? We need to do yes. more work as it relates to women and heart disease, oh. right? Exactly. Charles, jump back in. For, from a psychological and financial point of view, I cannot speak for everyone, but by trade, I'm, I'm a financial planner. We get into emotional, psychological, lots of issues. I'm not going to deal with what's happened to me, and I've heard others tell me. Some people are in denial that they have a problem anyway. You know, that, that really shouldn't be happening to them. I took care of myself, whatever they want to <laughs> say, okay. Right. Two is, is that they don't have the trust they need to have in medicine and doctors, and there are reasons and good and bad about all that. At the, they may not have an advocate that stands to them, like have a wife or, pardon me, excuse me, someone who cares. That's right. right. Could be they anyone. They need an advocate, all right. And they may not have the self-image, frankly, or another point of view, to really they should take care of themselves in the first place. That's right. And we have financial issues going on right now that are very difficult. There's a lot of things facing Meaning people Meaning someone right says, I'm, I'm trying to hold on to a job. I'm trying to hold on to my house. I'm trying to send my kid to school. You want me to be worrying about my heart? Doctor, what do you say to those people right now? I've got a minute left. First person says, come on, I've got enough other things to worry about, you say. Well, it's better than the alternative, which is, um, uh, you know, it's where and when it's too late to worry about anything. Uh, and there are the unfortunate realities uh, that Charles was talking about. It's hard, it's hard to convince people to come to the doctor when they're going to miss a day of work and maybe they'll get fired. Um, but, uh, you know, I try to be as, as uh, flexible as possible with uh, patients to try to meet them halfway whenever I possibly can. Um, but uh, you just have to... Uh, try to explain to people how important it is and, and, and try to do the best you can. It's funny, all the innovation, all the technology that we're talking about as we started this program, 
in the end, people have to be proactive about their own care, do they not? Oh, of course, yeah, of course. I mean, you have to be pro, that's what, uh, all of what we're talking about is, is pro-action. You know, it's pre prevent, prevention and pro-action. Bottom line is all of you have done a very important public service. I want to thank you for joining us, talking about uh, cardiac innovation, cardiac care. But most of all, I want to thank you, Charles, for coming on and telling your story because I have a feeling you helped a lot of people. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. And 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, the heart of academic medicine, Health First New Jersey, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, and by Roche. Promotional support provided by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey, The Star Ledger, and NJ.com, Everything Jersey, and by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan is growing in the Garden State. Thousands of members in Bergen, Essex, Hudson, Passaic, and Union Counties depend on Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan. And in January 2012, Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan will be available in Somerset and Middlesex counties as well. If you're eligible for Medicare and live in New Jersey, find out more about Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan. Health First New Jersey Medicare Plan. Feel good about your health care coverage. I'm Steve Adubato. Join me for the next edition of Caucus New Jersey Taxes, Healthcare, Education, and the Economy. I'll ask the questions that you want answered. Airing on NJTV 13 and WHYY. Check your local listings.